you can vibrate a membrane with muscle. So one of the common insects in uh, Kansas is the doll day cicada. Uh, there's also periodical cicadas, the ones that come out every seven, seven years. But I'm, this here is the, uh, the dog day cicada. So I'm going to play the sound. And what I want you to listen for in the sound, uh, the, the sound is caused by muscles vibrating what are called temples, which are membranes on the side of the, uh, the abdomen. Okay, so the temples uh, would be in this area uh, right in here. On the, we're looking down there at, uh, at, at a cicada. This will be familiar, but the muscles get tired. And so at the end of the call, you'll, you'll sense the fatigue. And it'll just stop.
<laughs> uh, there's, there's something we're counting to see if we got there. Uh, you'll recognize the snowy tree pig immediately as the crickets, where in movies, when they want to communicate silence, this is what they use. Right? Even, even if it doesn't exist in, the, in that particular area, they'll, they'll put in the snowy tree pig. There's a, a 76 degree Fahrenheit one. So they're poikilothermic, their activity varies with the external temperature. And so things are going to get really slow here when we go to the 54. Pretty lethargic. Okay, so on we'll go. Candidates have wing wings for gelation. Okay? So they don't use their legs, they use their wings. Uh, anatomically, what happens is the base of the wing at the front, uh, on one side there's a file, and on the other side there's a scraper. And what they do is move their wings really fast to produce the sound. They just rub the file and scraper together. That's how they produce their, uh, their sound. In addition to that, uh, they have this uh, area of the wing called the mirror. And the mirror acts like a bass drum to reverberate sound. And that, combined with the fact that they're in the grass, uh, means that they're very difficult to, to localize. There have been times where we thought we were right on top of one, and it takes us minutes to finally figure out where it is, because they're, uh, they're, the, the way the sound travels through the habitat, the way they can uh, shape the sound, uh, they're, very, they're very hard to find. Okay. When we started working on the katydids, based on my prior bird experience, what I told students is we can classify them into some groups based on how they sound. And so we put them into four informal groups. The buzzers, the buzzers with chips, which sounds like a bad appetite that you might get somewhere, or the rattlers, or the, or the pulsers. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play some of these songs for you. Uh, and if you haven't thought or heard about Katie did before, you're probably gonna think to yourself, oh, I know what that is. That's what's been keeping me awake at night. Some of them are daytime callers, and some of them are nighttime callers. And some of the nighttime ones are rather loud, including this first one. Uh, Neoconocephalus robustus, the robust cone head. The scientific name here, Neoconocephalus, means new cone head. Cephalus is head, cephaly. Uh, and so you can see that all of them have uh, projections on the tip of their heads. That's why they're in this genus together uh, with one another. They're big cake bits, 1.8 to 2.6 inches, so you'll know if you find one. Uh, pretty good size. Right? Prairies, cornfields, tall vegetation. Here's how they sound. Not easy to sleep with that by the window, right? It sounds familiar? A constant uh, buzzing, loud and continuous. Here's another one, the brass head. Uh, it's uh, an intermittent buzzer. It's also very common uh, in Kansas, at least in this area. I don't know if it exists too much in uh, the more agriculturalized western uh, Kansas. It's going to buzz and then stop, buzz and then stop. Uh, 
uh, and they mostly die naturally. If they're not dead by the time the first frost occurs, the frost kills them. And then they overwinter as a species. Their existence is as eggs buried in plants. And then when it gets warm again in the spring, those eggs will go develop through the uh, nymphal stages uh, and then into adulthood. Here are two more. Uh, the slender meadow katydid is one of our favorite, very widespread. Those of you who have uh, had a rainbird sprinkler, you know how the rainbird sprinkler sounds? You know, it goes until it gets to the end and it goes back. That's exactly what this katydid does. The first time we uh, heard the recording of it, and the first time we heard it in the field, I said, I'm going to call that the Rainbird Sprinkler Kitty Kid. And then finally, uh, the pulsers. Uh, and these don't make necessarily pretty sounds. Uh, this one does, actually. Uh, this is the common true katydid. It's actually the katydid that gave the entire group its common name. And so this katydid is primarily arboreal, is up in the trees, and this, the song is katydid, katydid, katydid. Uh, have lived there. 
I also uh, was right to use living organisms. The Katie has been wonderful study, study subjects uh, for us. One last note. Uh, when I went to uh, Belize and Bethel College, I thought it was a one-time experience. It turns out that I returned to Belize 10 times in the 14 years after I went on the first trip. Formed friendships down there, took students on, on trips, much like I had done, and started research projects down there. All of you probably know where Belize is, right there. Uh, it's a very peaceful uh, country. Uh, no military uh, to speak of, just a, a minor defense uh, force. Uh, home to uh, a very diverse group of peoples, everything from Griffith to Mayan to Mennonite. Uh, all of them are, are down in, in Belize. It has an important mountain area uh, right there. And so, just I'm going to quickly go through this because I know that I'm, my time is getting short. This is all protected area of one sort or another. In a country no bigger than Massachusetts, almost half of it is protected area. And so, Belize has done a wonderful job, especially in this mountainous area, uh, protecting it. This is some of the pictures uh, of places we worked uh, down there. There's even primary forest. Forest has not been logged yet. This is an example of, of a very remote region next to Guatemala uh, that we worked out of. One of my favorite cities in Belize, San Ignacio. We worked in a variety of habitats, maize, beans, so beans and, and corn. Uh, this is cacao. And so if any of you like chocolate, uh, these pods right here that are hanging on the tree uh, is where chocolate starts, right there, cacao trees. So we're interested in cacao trees. Uh, some limited coffee uh, that's there grown in the shade. Uh, and then regular, what people refer to as low bush, secondary forest. Uh, working down in Belize, though, is not easy. And I send students down there, and sometimes they would be frustrated. This is Brandy realizing that the place she's living in, the electric, was just not going to work. <laughs> and uh, she expressed her frustration uh, about that. So, wonderful Katie gets down there, though, uh, including some of the best examples of leaf mimics. Uh, that uh, species right there. You'll notice this genus, the Oklahoma Southwoods, are playing the songs for uh, that genus down there. Uh, this particular species uh, was only known in Florida in the Keys. Uh, we found it uh, down in Belize as well, which raised some interesting questions. One of the nicest discoveries that we made is this uh, particular genus, Phyllophilia, and uh, Robbie, another student, uh, found this and found her with her eggs. And so this is a collection of uh, eggs that are all glued together and they're glued to the stem of this, uh, of this branch. And so each of these will become an individual egg uh, after uh, sticking on the, on the plant there for a while. The interesting part about this is that uh, katydids are not known, in our understanding anyway, uh, to lay eggs externally. They normally put them inside the plant tissue. This species is stuck on the outside, uh, which we thought was uh, fascinating. It's also very handsome. You can see some markings on the face there, some areas where it looks like a leaf is dying. Uh, some nice colorations on the on wings, some more photos of the eggs. But the best footage that, that the best pictures that Robbie got, uh, and she was wandering around in the forest at one o'clock at night. And she said, I was so scared, terrified. Uh, it's not, it's unsettling to be in the middle of a foreign country in the forest at night, but she was rewarded for it. This is a cave, whoops. This is a cave in here, and you can see that this structure on the back of the abdomen is called the ovipositor. And the ovipositor is for the female to lay eggs in the plant tissue. And you can see what she's doing here. She has inserted, she's now taking her ovipositor out. This is an egg that gets inserted between the top and the bottom uh, rows of cells in the leaf. Yeah, and, and the, the delicate nature of that whole process uh, is fascinating. And so Robbie stood here for 45 minutes without disturbing the cake did as she did this. So she's done, she's taken out her little positor, and now you can see her move down the leaf. She does something with her mouth here that we're not, we weren't really sure about at the time. I don't understand the significance of that. You can see how this whole positor, the egg laying structures, you know, bowed upward. Uh, and so then you see her curl her abdomen around and, and uh, put her own positor back into the leaf and start laying the second egg. Uh, and so this is, these are the kind of moments that, uh, you know, field biologists kind of live for. You don't see this very often. I know in our age of 
National Geographic and Discovery and YouTube, we can see all the predation events and all the mating that takes place, but that's after editing lots of footage and lots of time in the field. And so the fact that Robbie got to, uh, to see us was great for her, and uh, it was one of the better finds of our Middle East trip.